So we picked up uh, one of our cheetah females with three of her cubs uh, yesterday afternoon. We sort of seen a deterioration in condition and then realized that um, they've got mange and it's also starting to affect their vision. So we needed to catch it quickly. And luckily um, our veterinarian was on site and he was able to, to come and assist us with, with darting the female and then the three cubs. So the key is to dart the, the mother first uh, because that sort of grounds the cubs and it makes it easier for us. They won't leave, especially not at that age, they won't leave the, the mum. So they'll stay close to her even once she's gone down um, and is immobilised, which then gives us the opportunity to dart the cub. quite risky. The cubs are only like two and a half months, so you risk potentially separating them from the mum, etc. But um, if we don't treat it, the likelihood of us losing all of the cubs is, is, is significant. One of the cubs had sort of wandered off a bit, so we actually played a call up. Um, um, it's basically a cheetah mum call, but we've got it recorded. And um, we're able to call that little cub in because it had separated from the mum. So we were able to dart all three, the cubs and the females. She also had quite a bit of mange on her. So we were able to treat them as a, a fairly um, easy treatment. And within the next sort of four or five days, we should start seeing a, a significant um, improvement and, and ultimately they'll recover fully. Um, and this is a seasonal thing. It isn't, it's not something that's ongoing treatment. So we shouldn't have to go back to her. Fortunately, it was also one of the females that have had a collar. So it was quite easy for um, us to locate. So we'll follow up tomorrow, make sure everyone's still together and happy. But yeah, it was a successful morning and um, yeah, a bit of peace of mind knowing that those cubs will do quite fine. The only private game reserve is partnered with the African Pangolin Working Group in rehabilitating pangolins which was confiscated from their legal trade back into a, a wild space. They obviously dehydrated, some of them got wounds and injuries, etc. Um, so once they sort of uh, get them back to full health, they will then move them to a park like Manioni and then it's part of our, um, our job to put them in a soft release program um, until they can be uh, wild pangolins again.
and the soft release program was quite critical because you know we don't know where those animals came from that they've confiscated so we don't necessarily know whether we've got the type of ant or termites that that pangolin would necessarily feed on so you can't just come and release it here and hope that it would do well so that's why we put in a soft release which means that they are um, in a program where we have to handle them so we take them out to feed on a daily basis we do a weight uh, weigh them before they leave and then when they come back from a feed to ensure that their weight gain is was adequate doing that feed that we've got the right species um, of ants and termites um, for that specific individual and then once we're happy for a certain period of time and especially if they've gotten to a certain weight that we can release them. And the, and the animals that we have, have, have um, managed to release in the park are doing exceptionally well. We've had some really exciting events where some of the males have, have met up with the females. We can obviously pick up on that because we monitor them remotely. Since then we discovered a pangolin pup was born in the reserve. Uh, we put camera traps up at the burrows and saw on one of the videos a little pup um, on its mum's back, which is very, very exciting and it means that our population is actually growing now and that the whole pangolin program is a massive success. Pangolins had uh, been sort of locally extinct in, in KZN for probably about 80 years or so, so it is also really exciting, it's groundbreaking conservation to be able to bring those animals back to where they originally were and like I said, ideally have a viable population with, with a growing population going forward. So the pangolin program is, is quite costly, um, the satellite tags and the VHF tags cost a fortune. We've also got a, a pangolin shepherd or pangolin monitor that goes out to them every day, so it's fuel and staff costs, etc. And in order to try and recover that, we invite people to come and see what the pangolin program is about, understand the conservation work that goes in it, and, and, and make a donation towards the program so that we can keep doing this and take on more animals. So it is important for us, and I think apart from the donation component is, is to create the awareness around it. People know so little, a lot of people don't even know what a pangolin is and people don't understand the plight of pangolins at the moment, even though they're one of the most trafficked mammals on the planet. So it is critical for us to create that awareness as well. We get a lot of support for that, which is absolutely amazing. We recently uh, partnered with the Global Conservation Force and they sponsored two canines for us to use as part of our anti-poaching unit. They now form part of the team. They are scent trained for, for mainly tracking humans. And um, Thor, um, the Bavarian mountain hound, we are now training on to also being able to follow pangolin scent. Thor and I, we are we protecting the the nature at Manyoni. He's still doing it, but he also in training. Yeah, so we always do everything. <laughs> Good boy, buddy. Having them part of our, our anti-poaching unit has been absolutely amazing. The staff really enjoy working with the dogs and they add so much value, especially when you've got um, your guys coming in after last light into the park and now with the guys having to track at night, which is very, very difficult. It's slow going, they often end up losing the spoor and that's when the canines um, actually play the most critical role and is the most useful tool for that, that, that type of work. This is my dog, uh, uh, Rollo. He's a Dutch Shepherd. He, he, he's a super pack. This, he, we, we are proud of this dog. The canine unit is just a, another tier to our anti-poaching unit and it really makes it a lot more successful. Um, canines uh, use their nose to track, humans use their eyes and, and we're not always able to see the tracks. So canine unit is very special in this country because we have the bushes, sometimes you can't track in the grass, it's, it's difficult to see this, the, someone tracks, but the canine make it easy. So we are able to target him specifically onto a scent that we want him to follow. What that allows us to do is to have the confidence that he's going to follow that scent that I've targeted him on and he's going to ignore any other human scent in the area. 
in this area especially there's a lot of research going on which is really awesome um, which also means a lot of guys on the ground so we don't want him really just choosing his own scent to follow. It's my first time to work with Kenya bike. Hey, I like it very much. It's like my brother. I've got a colleague in my, in my side now. It's super powerful. Yes. <laughs> the Rolo, the Dutch Japan. Sometimes we get disheartened, um, but when people get together and, and, uh, and help out, um, we do see a little bit of light at the end of, at the, end of the tunnel. Um, for us, it's very important to, to work together and to get the message of conservation out. It really takes a group effort in order to be successful in these kind of operations. It doesn't take just one single team, one single method of use. It takes a bunch of different ideas. Because we, as we are here, we are here to mother nature. We are here to conserve so that uh, endangered species mustn't disappear in this country. So we really are um, excited about working with the canines going forward and hopefully, you know, it's just another tool in the toolbox so we can keep fighting the fight and keep our rhinos safe and, and pangolins too.